Hi there, section 14. If you want some good study music, I'll, I'll tone this down in a minute here, but you really, really, if you've got a final to study for this spring, uh, just go online. Everything's on YouTube now. Uh, cue up Chopin, C-H-O-P-I-N, and then look for his Nocturnes, uh, the music uh, written about the night. Uh, and speaking of the night, I might look a little tired to you. I, I, I probably look tired all the time to everyone because I'm getting old and starting to look like heck. But I had a particularly challenging day getting home from Staples in this weather, and I am not going to complain about the weather. Let's just keep repeating. Snow is a form of light. Snow is a form of light. Snow is a form of light. And besides, I just heard my loons today for the first time. They found their way back, even though my deep, deep lake is still, unlike most of the lakes around here, uh, covered, uh, mostly covered with ice. They're just kind of skirting the edge. And I'm, I'm so, I cannot wait to get all this schoolwork done and get out there with my loons and then get back to more schoolwork in August. I always get sad at the end of school years and I just have to tell myself, you know, another school year is right around the corner. Super fast thought. Uh, there are days that teachers don't like to be in the classroom. Uh, one example would be an English colleague of mine at CLC, a fellow professor, won't name her, um, but she, when her birthday comes around, she takes a personal day. I would never do that. I would, I totally love being in my classroom uh, on my birthday, what could be more fun than doing something that you love? Um, meanwhile, on my end of it, I don't like Halloween at all, not one bit. I don't like what, um, I just, I just a lot of bad stuff happens at Halloween. And why am I I'm grumbling now about Halloween? I'll save those complaints for October. Um, an example of a, another day, and I'll go fast here because it's kind of a strange thing to think about. I don't like 420. I don't like April 20 one bit. And it didn't seem like anybody in Staples had any idea that that was the day. And maybe not everybody's hip to it. When you bring it up, there's like three or four students that are kind of smiling in kind of a lascivious way. But it, it's a day that makes me uneasy because it's a strange mashup um, of, of several things. It is a um, mashup of, uh, uh, it's an, uh, from, let's start with the, the most, the strangest part of it. It's Hitler's, it's Hitler's birthday. I don't like that guy. Um, sorry. I also don't like the idea that April 20th, 420 as we call it, is the solemn commemoration of the Columbine uh, shooting, one of the first big school shootings we had in this country. And um, that problem seems to be only uh, bursting into bloom uh, right now, uh, getting going. And it's also the celebra an international celebration of Weed Day. Let's, never, let's speak of it never more. I'm here with my dinosaur to try to make something happen. This is like my second attempt on this th on this thing. I had I, I made a whole thing, and I had the mute button hit again on my thing because I forgot which way the little button goes. Uh, I'm in over my head with all this technology and the batteries and the wires, but um, I'm better at it than I was when the um, when the holo uh, Holocaust when the apocalypse um, began. So here's here's what I have for you today. I have. Um, Excuse me, I put away my lesson plan and I need it. I have a few things for you today. I have uh, a poem by Kevin Young. I've got some beautiful books by him here. I think my favorite is The Book of Hours. Uh, this is a new book to me because it's a new book to everyone. Stones, poems, and um, here's uh, kind of his uh, greatest hits, even though he's still got a long way to go in his career. Blue, the selected and unselected, uncollected poems of Kevin Young. I've got a couple up north. And uh, I don't have all of them. He's written 13 books. Who could afford all those? But I would like to get going today by reading my favorite Kevin Young poem, which is called Hive. And it's a poem about a little boy. And I love poems uh, about children. I'd like to tell you about my card trick that I enacted in Staples this afternoon. I'm going to talk about love for a little while. And um, we'll show you some images of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I hope this sounds like a day. Kevin Young, Hive. The honeybee's exile is almost complete. You can carry them from hive to hive, the child thought. And that is what he tried, walking with them, thronging between his pressed palms. Let him be right. Let the gods look away, as always. Let this boy who carries the entire actual worrying world in his calm, unwashed hands, barely walking, bear us all there. 
buzzing, unstung. I'm the son of a beekeeper, so uh, I like bees. My wife is afraid of, well, she won't let me have hives on the property because she's allergic to the sting. And I'm like, you, we have 200 different wild types of bees in Minnesota. Why would you fret about that? So <coughs> I have to work, <coughs> excuse me, extra hard to get some sugar on this property. And this is the f first year in 20 years that I haven't been able to tap my maple trees because I took on too much work. We'll get back to it next year. Wasn't much of a season anyway because it's so weird. Um, moving along quickly, I... Uh, a lot of stuff that I do in Staples, just to tr try to keep these things vaguely in sync, can't be done here. So let me dim this so you don't have lights flickering in my crap cheaters. Um, one, of, one of the things that I've learned long, long ago is that if you walk into a, a classroom, well, or, or you walk up to a student, any student of any age, and say, okay, I want you to uh, go over to that computer and put your hands on the keyboard right now and write something profound and beautiful. I want it to be sublime. It'll never happen and I would never do that. But I have learned that if you give out three by five cards, just kind of whip them out in the room and then uh, say okay to get a class going. So it's a, it's a way to begin. Answer this question, tell me this, or complete this sentence. And when my Staples Motley students came in, they weren't all there today, the room didn't feel full. Up on the board I had written, love is uh, dot dot dot. I said finish the sentence. I'll tell you, I've done this so many times, I just know that it's true. You give somebody a 3 by 5 card, a student, and, and ask them to think about something that they've maybe never thought about before, oh, when you pick up the cards, light comes out of them. You'll, you'll get the profundity that you would never get if you demanded it. Um, and I had students finish the phrase, love is what? Define it. Define love, but stick with one sentence, not two or three. And they, did, they really did pretty good. And um, I think my favorite one is, uh, this is Odin's handwriting. Here I am talking about him on the internet. Love is something that is fraught far beyond all rationality. That uh, is, a, is a real true thing. And then I asked them, okay, you know why I'm asking this? We're reading a novel that uh, is kind of a romance, or could be a kind of romance. G Jay Gatsby says he loves Daisy Buchanan. Do you believe him or not? Yeah, they did. This time out, this room really, really um, b b believed him. They're like, yeah, look what, he's, look what he's doing. He's spending his entire life. He did this whole shtick just to get back, to get back near her. Well, then I started uh, uh, probing a little bit and um, trying to get a little synthesis going on. And um, here's where I took it. Now, I want to say some things about the, the Great Gatsby today, and they are just... A ways of thinking about it. They're not nothing I say is definitive, ever. I'm I'm just not that smart. I'm just trying to make you think. And and one of the things that one of the, I, I picked on a couple. I picked on one student today a little bit gently with her permission. And the student's name was Lauren Rutten, uh, who I'm I'm fond of. I'm fond of all of them, uh, but she and I have uh, connected and um, and a, on a human level. And the the class began today before we, they even sat down. I said, Hey, can I talk about the jellyfish thing? And I'm drifting a little bit here, but she's like, yeah, that's fine. So I was reading all the journal entries about water, and uh, she, she wrote that she got um, stung by a jellyfish when she was swimming in the ocean when she was a little girl, and her mom peed on her. And I read that, and I went, that is the weirdest thing I've read in this entire pile of folders. So I had to go Google it, and I, so I reported to the class today, hey, her mom saw it on an episode of Friends. I'll tell you the same thing. If you ever get stung by a jellyfish, don't pee on it. Don't, don't. This, it'll make it worse. This is the most important thing I've taught you. Um, but then I, 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 I needed her later for a little, a little bit more of a serious inquiry. I said, how many of you are romantically involved with anyone? Anybody going out with anybody? Well, her hand went up in the air. And then I went, wait, is it that cute guy I saw on Facebook that you went to prom with? He is cute. Oh, and the class got all riled up that I called him cute. And um, we're not supposed to notice, right? Cute couple, nightmare couple, etc. But believe me. We notice. And so then I, I started asking her questions. Like, how, how long have you been going out with him? She said, 10 months. She was so happy about it. I said, whoa, that's a marriage in high school. And then I kept asking her questions. I said, okay, when you went out for the first time, did um, he open the door for you? Open the car door? Well, the answer was no there. And then I said, okay, another hypothetical. Say you're walking down Highway 10. Um, maybe you've had a car break. Maybe you're just walking around Highway uh, Breakdown. Maybe you're having a, uh, just a, you know, you feel like it would be romantic. 
If you're walking along Highway 10, who walks nearer to the traffic, you or him? Her answer was instant. It would be him, so he could protect me. I said, okay, uh, let's just mind the stereotype a little bit. Let's say you encountered a great big mud puddle. And weirdly, even though Highway 10 is just where the sky is big, let's say you can't get around it. What is going to, at least going to be his flash thought? And uh, she didn't have an answer, but Braden Salicito did. He said he's going to think that he should take off his coat and throw it on that water and have her walk across it. I said, exactly. So she won't sully her feet. So why am I thinking in this way? Let's give you a little bit of a history here. I, uh, when, I was, when I was young, as once I was, I, I like starting sentences that way um, because everything's behind me. A lot is behind me. I told my students at Staples Motley, and I'm telling you that when I was young, I saw a book in the Alcorn Library on the spine. The title was <clears throat> uh, The Art of Courtly Love. <clears throat> I thought, whoa, I got to have that book. I'm going to check that book out right now. That'll help me woo women from the College of St. Benedict. Took it back to my beloved third grade uh, dorm room. And uh, sure enough, uh, it wasn't exactly what, uh, what, what I thought it was about. The, the author there was uh, Joseph Bedier. So here's the thing. Courtly love is kind of woven into this uh, book a little bit. And here's a little history that you need to know. We've always fallen in love. Uh, the stage manager in our town is going to say a real true thing when he says, we go off two by two. And pretty much everyone, everybody, steps into their grave married. Well, even though we've been falling in love with each other for centuries, and um, forgive me for thinking about it in kind of a binary way, because it's the way my head is wired, um, something changed, um, weirdly. Not weirdly, uh, spectacularly. In the 1300s in Western Europe, in all the countries of Europe, for some reason, something in the drinking water, some kind of mold in the, in the, in the, you know, the rye that they were making the bread with, for some reason, an unbelievable social phenomenon started up called courtly love. It swept Europe like a fire. Germany, Spain, France, Austria, England, everywhere. This was going on and it, was, it became like a huge thing. Some of it was fueled by some of the poetry of the time, uh, the, the music uh, that was sung by the troubadours and the troubadoras, because they were girl troubadours too. Uh, roaming France, plucking lutes, um, you know, get, getting people thinking about romance. And it, 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 I, I can't overstate how powerful this became. The, the basic model was a lord, even if he was married to another woman, would, would fall in love with a lady. And he would hold her at a distance. There were, there were rules. He kept her at a distance, couldn't talk to her. And the idea was that this, it would become idealized, right? And uh, it gets a little weird. It's not only um, historical, it's theological, it's psychological, it's social, artistic. It, it, it pretty much, courtly love uh, is still with us. It, it's still framing and informing how we uh, deal with, with relationships. And part of it's wonderful. Also, some of it is destructive and can, it can destroy you. And um, in those days, the idea was that you would fan the flames of your passion until you were just about out of your mind. And then you'd have like this, you know, this religious epiphany, uh, this outpouring. Um, Lauren had to go off to a signing today along with a couple other three students. They do that at Staples. One of great athletes signs to, um, you know, uh, go off to a college or university. The whole, half the school goes to watch it happen. Uh, I've never seen that in a high school, but that's some Staples Motley for you. Before she headed out, uh, and she stood to hear this, I said, if you can just stay a minute more, uh, I'll defend you from getting divorced from that guy someday. And I, I let her know this. It, maybe, maybe this is just common sense. Maybe this is stuff you guys already know. The culture. Think of how powerful popular culture is. Love is one of the most powerful energy systems in the world, in America especially. Think of our music. Think of our movies. Think of social media. We are uh, conditioned to believe that when we fall in love, and if you fall in love, you know what this is about, and if you haven't yet, watch out. When we fall in love, popular culture uh, con conditions, trains us to think that, that whoever we're falling in love with is perfect. Because if we're in love, it's gotta be perfect. You've created a religion with a fallible God when you fall in love. And the thing is, nobody's perfect. So in the early days of, 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 of two people getting together, whatever, whatever uh, arrangement there is, there's a perfection. 
right? And there's a, a bit of a madness, era fiora brevis, which is Latin for a brief madness. And because we th the culture has made us think that if we're in love, it's got to be perfect, and so too is the object of our love. <laughs> well, the obvious thing that happens is, we all know this, I think, romance can't last. Eventually, you, you're, that person you're looking with, going down the road with, standing with at a line in a bank, you look at them and you realize, you know, this isn't exactly what I thought I was getting into. This person is a mess, actually. They've got all kinds of flaws, and keratological flaws, and things that annoy me and irritate me. Uh, it could be anything. Uh, it could be the way they comb their hair. It could be the way they squeeze the toothpaste tube. If we still squeeze toothpaste tubes, it's an old example. And there's a moment there where romance has got to give away to something more permanent and long-lasting, and that's love. Yeah, there's a little romance left between my wife and I, 36 years in, but we're 36 years in because long ago we forgave each other for all those shortcomings. Now my phone is ringing in my head, which is very embarrassing because it's, it's uh, Bluetooth connected and it's upstairs charging, so I'm just going to have to keep talking until it quits. Uh, anyway, I think I, uh, I hope I explained that. Here's some images of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Oh, sorry. I don't think Jay Gatsby's in love. I think he's in love with the idea of being in love. Uh, he, he's been away from Daisy for years, which means he has built her into a kind of a goddess, right? Uh, that's what unrequited love is all about. Your imagination is free to create anything it wants to. So he's not entirely living an example, uh, uh, living in, re in reality. And there's a moment in the novel, late in the novel, where uh, there's been, they've had too much to drink, there's been some fighting, and Jay Gatsby decides to spend the entire night waiting outside, outside the Buchanan house, looking up at Daisy's window to make sure that she's okay. All he needs is a medieval lute in his hand because he is a full-on medieval courtier uh, who's uh, out, of his, out of his mind. And um, I, don't, I don't believe in it anymore. I don't believe in him anymore. Um, Although I love the novel, it's, it's important. It's the only novel that he wrote for, for young people. Here's F. Scott Fitzgerald as a little guy, um, sitting on a, an undersized horse, probably in a studio in St. Paul. You know, in the olden days, if you wanted to have a photograph taken, you had to go to a studio. Here's an image, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, of F. Scott Fitzgerald as a soldier, although he never became one, really, because the armistice was signed, and he got walked off that boat, that ship in New York City. We go off two by two. That's kind of my theme today, if I could be said to have one. Yeah, he fell in love with a woman named Zelda, who was a Southern Belle, and her dad did not like him. She did not um, want, he did not want her to marry a Northern boy, especially a Northern boy who thought he was going to be a writer. And she more or less ran off with him um, when he had his first novel published. R rough marriage, plates flying through the air. They were never true to each other. He spent half of his life um, writing short stories and novels to pay for her uh, as asylum bills. That's what we used to call psychiatric wards in the olden days. Uh, she had some mental health issues, but she was also an artist and a dancer, and an artist in, in her own right. That should not be ignored. Uh, they had a, a single child. Scotty was her name. And holy cow, did F. Scott Fitzgerald love her. Uh, I, I never got to live the father-daughter paradigm, maybe because of a couple of miscarriages we had long ago in this house. And, but I, I did get to live the father-son paradigm, and that's plenty good. But F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, had a daughter who he absolutely adored. And yeah, I'm interested in the idea of a father-daughter paradigm. Um, so, so much so that I actually have at least two collections in my libraries here of letters that were written between famous fathers and daughters. One of them is Galileo, the letters that Galileo Galilei wrote to his, his daughter when my church put him in prison for 15 years because he uh, had the audacity to proclaim that the earth was not the center of the universe. universe. He was kind of right um, in a physical way. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now. And I also have, a, I have the collected letters between F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and Scotty. And gosh, are they affectionate and loving and, and for, forgiving. Uh, last thoughts today, because I'm getting near the 20 minute mark. Many famous Minnesotans have um, uh, come from Minnesota. Let's just put it that way. I'm getting tired. Um, you think uh, 
Judy Garland, right, from Grand Rapids, Minnesota. She was um, um, Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. You could think Sinclair Lewis, who wrote, won the Nobel Prize for Art, uh, art uh, excuse me, uh, Main Street, which is about Sox Center, Minnesota. Uh, yeah, we got all kinds of famous act, act, athletes. We got Bob Dylan, but the only Minnesotan who got internationally famous, who pretty much stayed home, was Prince. Girls up in North Minneapolis, and he uh, uh, didn't go very far, did he? Chaska Studios. Died the day I brought Juan Felipe Herrera here. I already told you that. And um, you know what? What happens when a, somebody becomes a celebrity and they leave? The town gets mad at them. And it can take years, decades to forgive them. But check out this uh, statue of, uh, of Scott Fitzgerald in downtown St. Paul. St. Paul did forgive him. And, and the, the big moves that they made, the big move was to take the old Orpheum Theater and rename it what it's called right now, the Fitzgerald Theater, because we uh, for, have forgiven him because it's the most important of all human activities. And um, if you ever, I've hugged this statue. It's in downtown St. Paul. I don't want to go to 22 minutes. If you ever get to downtown St. Paul, run up and hug this statue and whisper in its ear, Jeff Johnson sent you. See you soon. I'm going to put up a single journal entry for you. You'll be fine.